Mario Batali believes olive oil is precious as gold. Shorts are acceptable attire for every season, which you'll see in a minute. And food, like most things, is best when left to its own simple beauty. To that end, Mario Batali with business partner Joe Bastianich create magic night after night in as many hot spots in New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas, the flagship of which is well known to most Googlers, Babo Restaurante in Inoteca. Babo, like Google, turns 10 years old this year, so it's only fitting that a table at Babo is the reservation that is most requested of Google New York's concierge team. Among Mario Batali's accolades, James Beard Foundation, Best Chef New York City 2002, Outstanding Chef of the Year 2005, and Zagat voters chose Babo as the number one restaurant, Italian restaurant in New York City. Mario's new television series, Spain on the Road Again, with Gwyneth Paltrow and Mark Bittman, airs this fall on PBS. Ladies and gentlemen, Chef Mario Batali. Don't you guys have something to do today? <laughs> um, as an addendum to uh, the illustrious strategy of getting reservations at the restaurant by going through the traditional methods of using the telephone, <clears throat> my assistant is in the back row there, and she does take cash bribes. <laughs> that said, also, just as an aside, in every restaurant in America, particularly here in the hot spot of New York City, Every time and every evening there are reservations, there are also cancellations and no-shows. I believe many of you probably even know, maybe even know somebody who plays Russian roulette with the reservations and makes four or five reservations for a single night and then decides to honor one of them while either not going or canceling the last ones at the last minute, which seems a little bad, but actually works out for the regular people who don't know where they want to eat exactly one month to the day in advance. So your best bet is to walk into a restaurant and smile and say, we'd love a table, we don't have a reservation, but we spend a lot of money on wine. That <laughs> will get you a table just about every time. So, and also, even if you don't spend a lot of money on wine, in every one of my restaurants, we save tables up in front. And if people just show up and they don't try to pretend they have a reservation code or they don't try to pull a scam, we want them to eat there. So as long as you're pleasant and patient, you will always get a table. And this goes for the Daniels and the super end, high end restaurants. They always have cancellations and no shows. So there is hope for those of us who really only know what we want to eat about two hours before we want to eat it. That said, my new book, which I forgot to bring, but many of you have, is called The Italian Grill. Uh, the first question I normally get is what is different from the Italian Grill than the American Grill? And in fact, there's not that much difference. The Italians do not have the predilection for thick, goopy red sauces, but they do like to cook things on the flame, and they like to cook it simply in the same way that we do. When I grew up, a barbecue was actually the piece of equipment. It was actually what we called what we cooked things on. Now it's become the grill, and barbecue has now become its own nomenclature for food cooked over smoke as opposed to over open hot fire. And Americans, of course, own barbecue. We are the best barbecuers. When Italians come to America and want, and I really want to impress them, and we happen to be in the Deep South, then I'll take them to a place where they make delicious barbecued food, which is generally pork or beef based, and often finished with a thick goopy sauce, which is actually delicious. The Italians, on the other hand, like to put a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, maybe some sea salt, and maybe a squeeze of citrus on just about everything. For them, the concept of umami, which is the fifth flavor component of your tongue, to the Japanese, is no longer a brushed, fermented soy or enriched product. The umami for the Italian culture is actually the delicate interplay of the smoke with the flavor of the main ingredient. The main ingredient, however, always has to be the main thing. And it's for that that the Italians have become famous. They don't have the famous thick or even not so thick sauces of the French. They don't have the self-loathing of the Spanish. They don't have the fear of the American invasion of the Southeast Asians. They have just a basic comfort knowing that they invented the Renaissance art and have really just had to kind of skate ever since then. So you too can be an Italian griller, but most importantly, what you have to really be is an Italian shopper. Going and buying your first ingredients or your prima materia, as we say in Italian, is the single most important step. So don't go and just buy a pretty good steak and expect it to be any more than pretty good, because it will be pretty good as long as you don't burn it or serve it raw. Pretty much everything in America is pretty good. 
But if you want to really kind of aspire to the really delicious things, it's searching out and finding those great ingredients. It starts, of course, in your pantry. The first thing you always have to do is, in my opinion, go to your shelf where you keep all of your spices and throw them all away. <laughs> because you haven't made garam masala curry since 1993 when you got that first Indian cookbook. And it's still sitting in there as if to remind you exactly what wood shavings may taste like 10 years later. <laughs> so you want to throw them all out, all the spices, everything you have, and start anew. And then you have to reevaluate the ingredients that make the most often show in all of your dishes. In my house, that would be the kind of salt I use, the kind of extra virgin olive oil I use, the kind of balsamic and inexpensive red wine vinegar I use, anchovies, breadcrumbs. Find all of these ones and find the best one that you can. For salt, for example, at my house, we have uh, kosher salt for dry rubs. We have uh, coarse sea salt for grating as finishing things. And we also have something called Malden salt, which is a sea salt from England that has this particularly interesting shaley kind of texture to it, slightly lower salinity. So it's perfect for putting on things after they're finished. When I cook a steak, I char the outside. I cook the inside medium rare. I allow it to rest for 30 minutes, then 20 minutes. Then I slice it, I drizzle a little bit more extra virgin olive oil, and I sprinkle salt right on top because I've never had a salty steak. I've always had one that was maybe a little short of salt. So when you have these three kinds of salt, each one of the processes is important, and they actually have an ingredient that fits that. Extra virgin olive oil, you should find one that you like. There's all kinds of stores around that allow you to taste. Make sure you find one that you like and just use it on everything that you can. Then extra, extra expensive extra virgin olive oil are ones in the $30 to $40 range for a $750. That's what we use not to cook with, but only to finish things. So when I say I drizzle that steak after it's done with just a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, it's the super fancy one, the $30 one. <clears throat> and that's what makes things taste really tasty. And understanding the simple tenets of basically getting your stuff in order is 80% of the grill, and the rest of it's kind of technique. But technique is a little bit overrated in the grilling. There's really only one heat source. There's really only one or two different methods of transferring that. And it's really about the shopping and the ingredients. When people ask me what kind of grill I suggest, I suggest using the one you already own. If we were going to do it in true Italian style, we would be standing at the end of a thousand yards of Sangiovese vines, standing at the end and making a fire with the clippings of those vines and the olive trees that grow near them. If you don't have that, you should probably use whatever you do have. If it's a gas grill, if it's a hibachi, if it's whatever, it's not so much about that. It's just trying to get whatever you have is hot. One of the tricks you'll learn if you look at this book is understanding the convection heat of a gas grill. Gas is never as hot as a burning wood or charcoal. The problem with burning wood or charcoal is, of course, if you decide to have one extra Negroni, you could blow the entire cooking time. Because charcoal, no matter what, goes about 45 minutes and then it's over. So if you have a hardwood fire, you're in the ideal situation. But if you have a gas grill, make sure that you cook with the lid down unless things are less than a half inch thick, in which case then it's just the bottom heat. Desserts, you'll notice there are no desserts in this book, just because the Italians don't believe in grilled desserts, and I'm with them. In all honesty, you should have someone else bring dessert if you're going to make the dinner. And if, and, if, and if they're really good, they'll make it something as easy like a peach pie or a blackberry crumble or something that's really delicious, more often served with uh, ice cream or gelato, but most importantly served with some kind of a dessert wine. Which brings us to the beverages. The beverages should be anything that you like. Keep in mind that the Italians pretty much like to consume anything that they can, from watermelon to wine to beer to anything, just a little bit cooler than room temperature. I'm not down with that. I like my beverages stinging cold. So don't be afraid to use the last bit of ice, because in America, we know how to make more ice. <laughs> and in Italy, for some reason, the lady with the rice recipe must have died, the ice recipe must have died a couple years back, because they just don't have any. So use that luxurious good of ice and keep your cold beer and your cold wine cold and everything else. Actually, at this point in my life, I'm drinking my cold white wine a little bit warmer than I used to, and I'm drinking my red wine at a little bit cooler than I used to. So if you can get it all into the kind of red wine in the low 60s, high 50s, and beer at uh, 33, and cold white wine at 37. Uh, if you really have to, you can put ice in it, as a lot of my friends do. It's no longer not cool. It's actually a sign of being a rebel. Go ahead, <laughs> drop the cubes in the Conterno Barolo and just, the, the, the Conterno family's dying, just know that. <laughs> but don't worry about it. That said, the book is simple. All of the recipes in most of the things that I do are simple. It constantly surprises me 
that people want to see me talk about it or be on TV about it. Um, but it is fun, it's enjoyable, and the trick is, as with most great cooking, do a little shopping and don't spend too much time worrying about it. It's going to be all right. I want to thank you all for coming, and I'd like to open the floor. If anybody has any questions, bring them on up. Uh, hi, thanks for coming. Uh, what, uh, what chefs in particular, when you grew up, did you admire and kind of emulate kind of what you do for a living in, in terms of uh, cooking? Well, keep in mind, I'm, I'm, I'm not as old as maybe I look, but I was, uh, <laughs> I was a child in the 60s and 70s. And at that point, the job or career of a chef was really the last thing you did after you got out of the army before you went to jail. So there weren't too many chefs that I could emulate. The two that I remember watching on TV because my grandma thought they were cute was Graham Kerr and Lydia, I mean, uh, not Lydia, Julia Child. But, and they were fun and it was interesting and I thought it was great, but in my time, chefs weren't cool. And they certainly weren't anybody that kids looked up to. I mean, I guess I imagine that Chef Boyardee would be one of my heroes. <laughs> Until I tasted the canned ravioli, in which case, it went down the hill. But I mean, in my family, and I grew up in West Coast in what you might consider Sunset Magazine travel photoshopped edited world. But our family grew up cooking. My aunts, uncles, cousins, everyone in my whole family on the West Coast in Seattle pretty much cooked. And it wasn't a, a man or a woman thing. It was just kind of what everyone did. And they were all into foraging and everyone hunted and fished and cured and preserved and did all that stuff. So it's, it was, I remember with great trepidation walking into my friend Don Christensen's house, whose dad was a pilot and his mom was a stewardess, and seeing in the refrigerator for the first time packaged sausage. And I thought, you can buy that? <laughs> and the, the whole world of my generation was pretty much trying to figure out how to best utilize technology. So frozen food, uh, TV dinners, frozen banquet chicken, all those things were very kind of cool. And in that kind of hurry to embrace newness, we forgot a lot about what was supposed to happen. It's in the last 20 years that it's become cool, that farming farmers are actually the new chefs. They'll be the new cool people in the next 10 years. Watch them. And uh, bringing great ingredients to stuff has become as important as showing people how to cook or go to the restaurant. So when you go to the Union Square Farmer's Market and you can get everything from crazy scrapple to the right kind of chili, it's, it's, it's because our times have changed. And although there were no famous chefs when I was growing up, I probably aspired to cook more like my grandmother or my dad or my Uncle Dick or my Aunt Attilio or any one of these thousands of people just because whenever they made something that was really delicious, everyone responded positively, which was always a nice thing when you'd sit around and say, man, that was fucking good. <laughs> so that was my inspiration. Yes, sir. The first thing I remember making really well after a mess, which was always my first thing that I made really well, I think uh, cooking with my grandmother, she used to make these raviolis and she had this little tool that was a rolling pin with the little squares dented out of it. So she would make a sheet of pasta, then put in the filling, then put another sheet on it, and then just roll over it. And the, the kid's job was, after she cut it with the little kind of pizza cutter, crimping. So the crimping of the ravioli was one of the big first things. Of course, you may or may not know this, but my grandma's most famous ravioli was filled with uh, calves' brain, Swiss chard, and sausage. And it was served sauced with an oxtail ragu which if, if, if that didn't make Don Christensen get a little freaked out, all the other things she would serve did. And in fact, by the time you finally got or qualified to taste one of these raviolis, you would certainly be in line to help grandma unload the car when she came over to the house next time because they were remarkable. So the calves brain ravioli with the oxtail ragu was probably right up there. <laughs> yes. Um, if you went on Iron Chef America, which chef would you challenge? I am Iron Chef America. <laughs> <laughs> Um, who would I challenge among the existing already other Iron Chefs? Like more flame I would or... go with um, Michael Simon because he's the newest one and probably the most vulnerable. <laughs> I mean, if, I, if it really came down to it and I really had a choice, I would clearly look at the records and choose the one who hasn't won the most, which you all know who that is, so I'm not going to bring her name up. <laughs> But I love them all. They're all good. And the reason that we don't have to battle each other is mere luck because we just got, we were lucky. It's funny. It's a good show. It tapes two blocks from here. It starts in three weeks. So if you want some reservations to go watch the show, just ask Pam. She's right over there. <laughs> yes, sir. Excellent. 
Oh, hi. Um, I have a question about um, cooking pasta al dente. I, I see different interpretations of what that actually means. There's a place in Manhattan, um, uh, Bella Vita, I think. Uh -huh. um, they have a pasta that's, that's actually like, has a little even snap inside. That's like, it's really interesting uh, texture-wise. Uh, when you I, say interesting, do you mean delicious or it just actually, interesting? It, it's actually quite delicious. Um, but, you know, it's delicious and unusual because I've right. never had something that was quite that uh, less cooked, let's say. Um, I mean, Undercooked so what, what is the is word you mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so is there, my, my guess is that this probably is something that everyone has different opinions about, even in Italy, probably, like what al dente actually means. Like, I don't know, is, is that, would that be true, or is there more of a rigid definition of, like, how, how al dente really That's works? a very good question. How al dente is al dente. And in fact, it depends on the family, and it depends on, from our perspective here, on the brand of pasta you buy. But I can give you some suggestions. Generally, al dente still has a firm bite, but it should be no, no crunchy. No crunchy. <laughs> it should be yummy and not crunchy. That said, if you follow carefully the instructions on the package, my suggestion, and I think the most important thing to realize, is that the pasta has two legitimate cooking times. One of them is in the water, and the second one is in the condiment or the sauce. And what you do is, in, in my world, is you read on the package, and it says, whatever, 9 minutes, 11 minutes, whatever it is. Take it out two minutes before it's done on the clock. Throw it into the sauce, splash a little pasta water in there, and cook it over medium-high heat for that last minute, minute and a half. At that point, you're just about ready, and then there's going to be a little carryover time. I always count on that to be about 30 seconds. So I dump it out of the pan into whatever I'm going to serve it in or onto the plates at about a minute and a half after I've taken it out of the water, which is still 30 seconds short of what it might say in the package. But if you like it crunchy, have it crunchy. <laughs> and that's, I, know, I mean, I what it comes down to is there's kind of a, a, a cultural and gastronomic mafia in Italy that is run mostly by grandmas, but every now and then the restaurateur <laughs> tries to step in and take it over. It's, it, the family knows, but no one would mess with grandma and say her pasta is not properly cooked. It might be the sign, though, that she's ready for assisted living. Thanks. But it's your personal choice, but follow the instructions to within two minutes short, it'll be the right way. Yes, sir. Um, I'm very proud that you can see my grill from space. If you go to Google Maps and type in 459 12th Street in Brooklyn and zoom in on the roof of my building, you can see my grill. Um, One question. Is that due to the excellence of Google technology or the size of your barbecue? <laughs> both. There you go. They're both, brother. Um, how do I get it to heat evenly? There's a hot spot in the back, and I have those ceramic bricks underneath, and I try to distribute the heat. Is it um, gas? Gas, yeah, propane. And um, no matter what, it's always, well, actually, the hot spot moves around a little bit, but it's kind of right back there. And if I, I'm cooking a lot of food, um, it's really hard to time everything right because it's hot at, and cool at different spots. But how, how do I even the, the heat? It's very hard with a gas grill to actually have consistent, even heat. But keep in mind, the hot spot is your friend. So start everything in that hot spot and then move it to the cooler spot, and then just kind of judge it that way. If it's things that need to be served hot, hot, hot off the grill, then throw them on the hot spot right before it goes onto the plate. But a lot of stuff doesn't, and I think Americans have a misinterpretation of what delicious grilled food can be. Often it's served just slightly more than room temperature, and that's because you've allowed it to responsibly rest in the right position so the juices redistribute themselves and become in the right space. Anything that's a big, thick cut of meat always needs to rest at least 20 minutes. If it's just little sausages, roll them back over the hot spot and then bring them back on. But that you have identified the hot spot is to your advantage because that's where you'll do your initial char. And when you do that first char and kind of sear, that's what gives it that crust. I mean, there's a whole mess of cooks out there right now experimenting with both molecular gastronomy as well as this product, product process called uh, sous vide which effectively is poaching in a bag, which guarantees all the way through cookedness in a consistent way and a very tender texture. But when I eat something on the grill, I want it charred, almost burnt on the outside, almost too salty, then a little bit, maybe a quarter inch of well done, and then a slow straciation in the move to the perfect temperature on the mid on the inside. And allowing it to rest after it's cooked is going to allow you to do that. Having and establishing that first char, though, is key, and having a hot spot will help it. If you're looking for consistent heat, though, Get a half done, you know, one of them oil barrels and fill them up with hardwood and let it go. And about two hours later, come back and you'll have consistent long cook. Hardwood is the best way to actually have even heat. I, I think my grill is already in violation of New York City fire 
No, I'm not sure. Of that. Well, if it's already on Google, Maryland. dude, you're going to jail. So it's all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. Yes, sir. How's it going? Thanks, Thanks for sir. coming. I'm not going to use that. Eh? <laughs> um, I believe a chef always has a, a story of their first encounter with food that makes them flip a switch in their brain that's going to say, I'm now going to be a chef or be involved in food. Can you tell us your story? Okay. Um, my first encounter with food that made me want to be a chef. Actually, let me share you one which as actually one of my first encounters with food that made me not want to be a chef. <laughs> I was working, I, I went to the, I, my first real job in the food industry was at a place called Stuff Your Face in New Brunswick, New Jersey. <laughs> shout out, a shout out to North Jersey and Stromboli culture. Um, it was a great restaurant and what I really loved about it was the adrenaline rush from a successful service of working in a small place with a small team of people really making something truly delicious. And as a matter of fact, on Mother's Day, I took my mom and my family down to New Brunswick, New Jersey for a little Stromboli this year. And it's even better than I remember for some strange reason. But that said, I was working uh, after I graduated college and went to the Cordon Bleu, and I was working for a guy named Marco Pierre White, who is in town this week, if you see him around. He is uh, notorious and famous at the same time. He was the first uh, English-born chef to have three Michelin stars. He was the youngest chef to have three Michelin stars. He was the first guy to give back all of his Michelin stars. And he's here making one of those ridiculous Gordon Ramsay scream at the chef kind of shows that they're trying to weasel me into playing on. But I was working with him at a place called The Six Bells, which was a, a pub that, because they hired him, and this was before he was famous, had great aspirations to serving uh, modern Nouvelle French cooking in 1985 at a pub. I, I didn't understand it, but he was very talented. And the two moments came, actually. The inspirational moment was watching him work and making something that was absolutely perfectly delicious, and then presented in a way that was both beautiful and provoking at the same time. And it was, it was at that point when I realized, wow, there's more than just the cooking to this thing. There's the whole presentation and the whole kind of confounding and delighting the guests at the same time. About a week later, I was making a risotto dish that was at that time the side dish to some scallop dish that we were making, and feeling pretty confident about my Italianness and Marco never having moved off the island of England, uh, he said, this isn't right. And I said, no, that, that, that's right. And he said, no, no, Mario, take this risotto back and make it again. I said, dude, this risotto is perfect. <laughs> now, he's an imposing, forceful looking fellow with long hair. And you know, he tends to cook with a cigarette kind of stuck out of the side of his mouth <laughs> and a cleaver at his side. So you don't really fuck with him. <laughs> But at a, at a certain point, I realized that he was now getting very, very angry. And he grabbed the pan of risotto. He took one more taste. And from here to right here where this piñata walking project guy is, he threw this pan of risotto at me. And it smashed me in the chest and, of course, splashed up. And I remember thinking, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what really turned me on to the whole world. And it was just exciting and seeing someone that passionate about it. I mean, it was just a fucking plate of risotto in the end. But it was really, it was, it was understanding that people get that excited about something that I had considered your quotidian job. You know, you went in, you cook, you feed people, and you went home. And realizing that there was a whole kind of twist to the passion and the excitement and the adrenaline was a, was a good moment. So what was wrong with the result? Nothing. <laughs> it was... Spot on, as we say. <laughs> it was a perfect result. The guy was a moron. But now he's much smarter. <laughs> yes. Uh, not grow related, but a couple years ago, Trader Joe's used to carry a Vitali branded tomato sauce in a couple. Oh, you're shaking your head, you know. Uh, they stopped. Um, I really miss it. I can almost kind of fudge it with your basic sauce recipe. It comes close, doesn't keep at all, unfortunately, unlike the jarred stuff. And, uh, just curious if you had any plans to reintroduce something along these lines? Or? I do. Okay. I'm working on it right now. The problem with that sauce is that it was, a, there's a traditional way to making bottled and jarred sauces. And traditionally it involves putting all of the raw ingredients, including the onions and everything, into the jar and then superheating it, which also adds to its shelf life. Often enough that, eat, uh, that they need to use some kind of particular acidic component to it so that it kind of kills everything that's in it. Well, we started making that sauce, and they actually did it in these giant saute pans and sauteed the onions and sauteed the garlic and then added the carrot and the whole thing. And that's why it tasted good, 
but it became very difficult for them to keep up. And eventually it turned out that the people that were my partners on my business side decided to change the thing without letting me know. And that became the end of our relationship. So now we're working on uh, a new thing with a company called Jarusa. And I'm hoping it will be around by Christmas. But thank you. And it probably won't be exclusive anymore. It'll be in a lot of stores. But you're like this will be on the bottle, so I'll know which one it is. You'll definitely not be able to miss it. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Uh, when you first opened Poe, I guess 10 or 12 years ago, is that right? 1993, May 26th. Okay. My girlfriend at the time, now wife, paid you a visit, and you, uh, I guess you were working the front of the room, and you were in the back of the room, and we asked you how to make something. It was because something. it was so small, it was, it was easy tiny. to do both. <laughs> we asked you how to make something, and then you essentially took us into the kitchen, and we spent like the rest of the night in the kitchen with you, and you were giving us lessons, which was incredible. We still talk about it. The question that I have for you is, uh, you've been adding to your franchise at you know such an incredible rate. How do you scale and maintain consistency? Because it's you know uh, the product is just impeccable. Um, uh, so far, and right now we're involved in thirteen places. Uh, every one of the executive chefs, except for in Los Angeles, which is with Nancy Silverton and Matt Molina, actually came out of what I call our farm team. They effectively started with me sometime along the lines. Keep in mind that Andy Nusser, who is the chef and co-owner at Casamono, was the sous chef at Poe originally. Uh, Frank Langello, who's the chef at Babo for the last four and a half years, before he came to us as the chef, worked starting in the pantry and then on the hotline and then in the pasta line before he became the executive chef. And basically, it's something that I try to teach to the corporate world and other people of like mind that want to expand and do a good product, the most important thing you can realize is that you don't have to make all the money yourself. And eventually it behooves you to share with people that have your vision and understand your product in a great way, all of the people that I've just mentioned and at all of the restaurants except for the two in uh, Los Angeles. The chef is my partner and they have worked with me side by side. And I'll go out and do spot checks or I'll even cook on the line with them whenever I'm around because that keeps them and all of us together on the same page. The technical components of our cooking are very simple. There is no magic. There is no special heat treatment facility. There's no smoke and mirrors. So it's not hard to learn. The hardest thing about a restaurant cooking is making sure that it's consistent. And that's when you really have to let them know that I'd rather them 86 or take an item off the menu that night if it wasn't going to be exactly as I want. And that's a hard decision for them to make. And Having them empowered to do that is what really is the key. So uh, the, 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 the main message to that is train all the people that you work with, but also let them take off and even make a mistake and support them every now and then. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Hi, Mario. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Um, I was wondering, do you watch Top Chef? And if so, who do you like this year? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite was Jennifer Beastie, and she got thrown out because of some off-sized cheese cracker? I gave Tom Colicchio a long email that day. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't responded, nor should he. It's, in the end, it's TV. And it's, uh, it's funny. I mean, you know, the guy with the jaunty hat is, of course, going to stay longer than the guy who dresses like everyone else. Because the guy with the jaunty hat is going to be funnier longer. I believe he just got the boot. The jaunty hat just get the boot? Yeah. All right. I mean, my kids think it's the greatest show. So I watched with them. Last night we watched the restaurant Battle One. I mean, I don't, I don't even know when it comes out, but it seems to be on, is it Channel 18 or 16? Bravo, all the time. Bravo, like every day. So like, I don't have to rush to the premiere. I just catch it later on, and sometimes it's later than I even know. But that said, I think the guy, Richard Blaze, he's probably should win. But that may not be the way the angle is. I saw Bourdain defending his decision to throw Dale off in that he doesn't care what Bravo says and that they don't have an arc. And I don't know that he knows their arc, but I'm pretty sure they must have an arc. I mean, it's a reality show as far as you can throw reality. But in the end, I think good cooks come out of it. The most perplexing thing to me is all of the winners of the Top Chef so far are still unemployed. <laughs> and I think that someone told them that once they have their 15 minutes of fame, they can sit back on a chair they were given bad information. So you see guys like Elon, who was the sous chef at uh, Casamono. What the fuck is he doing? It's two years later. I mean, he had his little $100,000 prize. He hasn't done anything with it except for 
you know, get bigger bling to do his hip hop dance with. <laughs> but none of these guys have realized it's a leg up to get yourself together to do a restaurant and maybe a couple other things. So I like the show, I do watch it. And it's, you know, it's fun. But I think, I think Richard Blaze is gonna win. He, if, I don't know if you've seen it, but he was the, one of the molecular gastronomists who battled me in Iron Chef. And clearly, the judges are not down with molecular gastronomy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, quick question on ingredients. Beef, any thoughts on grain-fed versus grass-fed? Yes, thoughts on grain-fed. Uh, there's a lot of grass-fed beef out there, and I think that uh, ideologically it is a magnificent and perfect concept. That said, I, I like American beef, and although I don't think we should channel all of our resources into the Michael Pollan evil garden of manufacturing, using a little grain to finish or fatten beef at the end isn't out of line and not, it's not that hard. Feeding them on grain the entire time, of course, they're ruminants, so it's really hard for them to figure it out. But I like grass-fed and then finish with a little corn. We're actually working on a process. <laughs> now they're bringing in some of my cattle right now. <laughs> now, we're working on our own proprietary beef brand called BB&L, which should probably be available uh, retail next spring. It will be organic in that it, all of the feed will be organic. It will be grass-fed. It will have no growth hormones and no antibiotics, but it will have a finish of corn that will be spruced up with a little bit of molasses. And you can remarkably taste the feed on an animal when it's done and ready and properly aged. And that is going to be what we're going to do. And our first store will be here in Manhattan, so you guys will have the early access to it. Thank you. Sure. Last question. I have to go fast, apparently. Um, I've been developing recipes for food magazines for years, and I shy away from grilling fish. What best fish is to start learning how to grill fish properly. I mean, I've done a bluefish and I've done calamari, things like that, but for some reason I just don't want to go near it. I'm afraid I'm going to ruin the fish. Is the problem that it sticks to the grill? Or is it just, the you're just is nervous about there. it altogether? <laughs> it's the only, yeah. I mean, I just, I just don't, you know, I'll do a whole fish and I'll stuff it and wrap it and pancetta, all that. That's fine. Right. But like what, sim if, you know, family. The easiest fish to start with are the staking fish. Uh, tuna, swordfish, swordfish, tuna, salmon, ones that are cut across as opposed to with the filet. Okay. Because that gives you a little bit more to hold on to. Um, the trick is with all things that you don't want to stick to the grill, is don't put oil on the grill. Have the oil, have the grill clean, but don't put oil on it. Put the oil on the fish. And when you put it down, resist the temptation to touch it. <laughs> Let it cook for, I mean, I cook, uh, when I do grilled fish, I literally cook it 85% on the first side and just turn it over to finish mm -hmm. it. And that's because I want that char on it. I would like those nice little grill marks. The trick is to allow it to cook. The protein will eventually pull away as it Meat. cooks. Okay. And just kind of slowly, carefully lift it and turn it over. It's better for me to cook fish one degree under than one degree over. So pay attention to the carryover time. But cook it 80% on that first side on the two flips and then finish it over and it's done. Okay. But if you do it with tuna and swordfish, it can't go wrong. It really can't go wrong. Okay, great. Thank sure. you. Thank you very much, Chef Vitali. We're going to do book signing up in Hemispheres, uh, so we're going to rush right up there. Let's give Mario a big round of applause for coming here today.